Yo, welcome back to the channel. So today I was supposed to be doing a on the tools video, which I can't really do. So instead I'm going to do a, a fault loop impedance testing tutorial while I've got to sit at this panel and basically wait for phone calls to isolate and stuff like that. I may as well quickly run through the test process in 10 minutes and uh, yeah, hopefully help some of you guys out in understanding the test and uh, yeah, the theory behind it as well. Let's run the intro and get into this video. So earth fault loop impedance testing is probably the easiest test to actually carry out or calculate to be honest, but it's also one of the most important. Before we get into that, you probably want to know or you might want to know what impedance is, what loop is, all that sort of stuff, so we'll quickly cover that. Impedance is basically the same as resistance, uh, just under live conditions. So impedance is voltage divided by current. Both, you know, get measured in ohms and both of them are basically the same thing. The loop is basically the fault path so it starts at you know where the fault occurs and then it goes all the way through the installation through the circuit the CPC the boards the mains the meter the cable under the ground all the way to the sub to the transformer to the windings of the transformer it's literally that whole loop so you're just measuring that fault path basically that earth fault loop that's yeah probably the easiest way to explain it without getting too technical so now you know sort of what it is you might want to know why you're doing it so uh, as electricians we like to provide a little something called automatic disconnection of supply that's where the supply is going to automatically disconnect in the event of a fault and yeah earth fault loop impedance or limiting that is a is a wonderful way to achieve automatic disconnection of supply and it's basically how any MCB will operate um, under fault conditions not not under under overload but under fault conditions to get it to trip so yeah that's basically why we do it every circuit breaker uh, will have a prescribed value in which it will trip within a certain amount of time now the time it needs to trip in depends on the circuit whether it's distribution or, or you know a, a circuit serving a purpose all sorts of things can dictate how long it needs to you know the time that it needs to trip within generally for most final circuits and you know your average circuit is going to be 0.4 of a second there's a table within the regs which dictates you know a type a 10 amp c type breaker to disconnect in 0.4 of a second it needs to have a maximum ZS or a maximum earth fault loop impedance value of this number and then all you're doing is testing that circuit to see if the earth fault loop impedance is below that threshold and therefore it will trip on time. If it doesn't then you need to look at changing the breaker type, changing the breaker, redesigning the circuit and that's why this is quite important because this should all have been thought about before you've even wired any cable before you've even done anything but it's also very important if you're checking an existing installation to check that the design's been done correctly and you know the circuit hasn't deteriorated or things haven't influenced the value so yeah although it's a super basic test super easy test you can see why it's actually quite important to to do it and to, to verify it so now you know what and why how how can you get your ZS value? So there's actually two methods. Method one is yeah, just by testing, basically, literally testing the, the circuit at the end of line at the furthest point. I'll get more into that in a sec. And method two is calculations. So this is something I'm not gonna get too much into, but basically ZS is your, your earth fault loop impedance from the end point of the circuit from, like I say, the origin, from the transformer or whatever. But there's also something called a ZE. And the best way to understand ZE is it's basically the same, but the E stands for external. And what you would do is you would measure this from the main switch back. You wouldn't include any of the circuitry, anything like that. You just do it from the main switch back. Now you have to get a ZE as part of an initial verification and as part of a EICR or something. So you could get that value and then you could add on your R1, R2, which is basically, like I said before, the, you know, it's the same resistance and impedance is the same. So you're basically getting your external impedance and adding on the resistance of your circuit to calculate your ZS. 
I hope that makes sense. I hope I haven't confused anyone too much. But yeah, method two is calculation, and the way you can calculate it is by having the resistance of your circuit, your R1, R2, which is you know the earth fault loop of, of that part, and then adding it onto the external impedance, the external earth fault loop impedance um, of the installation to calculate it. Now that is actually the preferred method, I think, because it just involves less live testing, taking less things apart, but yeah, everyone on site just uses test method one, to be honest, just actually tests it. So yeah, we'll go back to test method one, and to be honest, it's super, super simple. So back to test method one, the actual testing. And to do this, you're gonna need a, a fault loop impedance tester, or what you'll probably have is a multi-function tester configured to an earth fault loop impedance setting. Now they call it like max Z or loop high, uh, Z ref high or something like that. It will probably have Z or loop in the name and that's how you can work out what setting to go on. There's actually two uh, settings for this test. There's high and low or or normal and no trip, depending on how the tester sort of calls it. Now it doesn't really matter, you're not gonna blow yourself up if you get the settings wrong, as long as you're doing everything else right. But basically no trip or low is a lower test current and it's not gonna trip any circuits that are protected by RCDs, but it takes a lot longer and arguably is a little bit more inaccurate because it makes some assumptions and it does some calculations. And then the high or the normal test method is really quick, but it will, it will trip RCDs RCDs or circuits incorporating an RCD before you get the result. So obviously it's going to be a bit of a nuisance. It's not going to allow you to do the test. So yeah, if you've got an RCD, go on low or no trip. It'll just take a little bit longer. And um, if not, then just do it on high or sort of standard mode. Just make sure you get that right before you start cracking on. When it comes to the actual test process, you want to go to the end of the line or the furthest point of the circuit. Now you might have multiple points of these so technically you should test all those end of lines I guess but what you're doing is you're just verifying the circuit in its entirety and in a sort of worst case scenario so you want to be as far away as possible to yeah to get that value basically the test is so so simple so if you're doing it on high you're going to have the the line or the live lead and the the earth CPC lead and you're literally going to go between line and earth um, at the furthest point, press test and you'll be given a value and it'll be super quick. If you're doing the no trip mode, it's actually a free lead test, so it's line, neutral and, and earth, CPC, and uh, yeah, you connect onto all three of them again. It might be a bit tricky to hold all three sort of probes with one hand, but you, you can do it. And that again will give you the value and that is, that is the test considered complete. Obviously, once you've uh, you've got your result, you just want to draw it down into the ZS column, but you also then want to verify that information. So that's the important bit. It's not just about writing the result down. You, unless you know what you need, you want to go into the book. I will put, I can't remember the page number. I think it's table, table 41, I think. I don't know chapter 41 table 41 i'm pretty sure but if not i'll put the i'll put it on the screen what exact table it is and where you can find it and that will list yeah you know all of the maximum zs values for breakers for for rcbo's for fuses bs 88 every everything it will list it all but yeah you just want to find the prescribed or the maximum value for your your circuit protective device and make sure you're below it and verify that that's a super important thing i've caught out so many people where they've done testing and it's like yeah that's cool well done you've got the result but all of these circuits fail you know yeah make sure you do that because i've been pulled up on it i pull people up on it and uh, it's kind of the whole point of the test obviously there's loads more theory to this but I'm just trying to keep these videos actually shorter I used to go a bit heavy on these tutorials um, but I want to keep them short and sweet easy to digest and yeah you know it's great if you're watching this at home but imagine if you're on site you're just gonna want the info but yeah if you do want more info check out guy notes free it has so much more about the test other things to think about etc but yeah I just wanted to keep this short and sweet obviously it's a live test as well so make sure you know you're working safely you're limiting your exposure to live conductors and yeah you're just you know treating that with the with the respect that it deserves hopefully you found some value from this video you've learned how to do the test maybe learned something new and uh, yeah make sure you subscribe for more tutorial content like this or more on the tools content like the stuff behind me um, but yeah thanks for watching guys I'll catch you on the next one